Oh, we have uh, Irfan Khan, who's going to come to talk us about SAP platform and technologies from a sales point of view. So we can, uh, so Irfan, some of the background is that we have had a steady theme throughout the day, mm -hmm. which has been, uh, you know, you have a lot of customers that we've had a long time. Um, how are we helping them understand the benefits of the new platform? Um, there was a question in an earlier session, something along the lines of, you know, if a customer is thinking of going another direction, what do you say to them? So you don't have to answer that straight away, but All right, just fine. some of the background. The okay. First, introduce yourself and... Certainly, certainly, thank you. I actually had uh, 75 slides prepared for you this afternoon, but I thought we won't use any of the slides. I'll just have this more as a dialogue and as a conversation, which I hope you'll appreciate. Uh, the purpose of my um, session today, actually, as, as exactly as Timo has pointed out, is to give you a customer lens. And just in terms of my responsibility, so uh, I've been at SAP for about a decade now, came through one of the acquisitions that was made in 2010, this big spending spree that SAP went on, this 75 billion that has been spent over the last decade. I was essentially maybe cust or company number two that was acquired, that was Sybase uh, back in 2010. And uh, my last role at Sybase was chief technology officer. And my current role at SAP is president of uh, global sales for platform and technology. So you can see how the pendulum has shifted from being a technologist to now being a sales leader. But the purpose of me really uh, to share with you today what I wanted to go through is really to give you some of those customer sort of sentiments in terms of that path that they're on, the delivery path that they're on from not just changing what they do today, but looking to make sure that they disrupt the future as well before they get disrupted themselves. So let me I'll just start off by sh sharing some broad strokes and then um, by all means you can interrupt, you can ask questions and I'm sure Timo, you've got some points and, and you may have some questions as well along the way. Great, and the folks online, we're, we're ready to take your questions. Okay, so let's just start off with maybe just a, a quick pulse of the landscape of our customers. What does it look like today and ultimately what are they saying to us as it relates to not just platforming technologies but in the generic sense of, of all the technologies that they've accrued over the last you know, however many decades that they've been working with SAP. The first thing to highlight is that there is a huge uh, gap that's forming between what IT can deliver and what business users actually want. And that in itself, and that sounds like someone, such a basic statement to make, but the, the challenge that we have is that because IT does what it does exceptionally well, the processes that they use to engage with the business are very, let's just call them antiquated. Meaning that at the beginning of the year, they typically get an IT budget. That budget is given to them as more often than not as a declining budget rather than an ascending budget. They have to essentially keep the lights on and they have to at some point in time do some discretionary spend to improve the operations or improve the business performance. That's kind of the chapter and verse what goes on in most organizations. But ultimately, what business users want now is they want the same kind of experience that they get from pretty much their consumer lives. Pretty much what's driven by the way that they interact with data outside of the work. And most organizations are falling you know, farther and farther away from where they actually need to be delivering the value. I'll give you one specific example in terms of we talk about this concept of uh, the experience gap and the experience economy. I give you a personal story, and this is something that actually happened to me in the last month. Uh, I have a very, very loyal following of British Airways. I've been using them for 20 plus years. I have a global role. I've been traveling for, for decades, literally. And one of the things that you expect is that when you turn up to the check-in desk and you turn up to uh, whatever the experiences that these, uh, these airlines provide you with, that it's, it's consistent. It's consistent, and the way that they treat you is, of course, with, because of the loyalty you've given them, they expect, you expect the same loyalty back from them. Now, British Airways, if you've been following it in the news, went on strike recently. So ultimately, they had a huge disruption to their, uh, their schedule, and therefore, a lot of the flights that were, were already planned, they got disrupted. So I was one of those customers. I got disrupted. I was expecting to fly into Brazil, and because it's part of an alliance, the One World Alliance, one of their partner airlines was, um, is actually LATAM Airlines. Never used them before, never even, actually never knew they existed, right? So LATAM Airlines was, was my uh, now new uh, carrier to take me from London Heathrow to, to Brazil. I boarded this flight, never used them before, and I got into the seat, and the seat was literally stuck at a 90 degrees angle. It wouldn't recline, it wouldn't do anything. This was a business class seat, so I was expecting, of course, to have a little bit of leeway, right? But of course, I was stuck in that, that horizontal, horizontal, that vertical position, essentially, and I couldn't move at all. Now, I landed after about 11 hours of a flight, and I had to jump it straight into the work mode. So I was not particularly pleased. I was very unhappy. Of course, the experience was terrible. But who do I hold accountable for that? Is it British Airways or is it LATAM Airlines? The reality is that British Airways was unable to provide me a service, so it punted me effectively to one of their carrier airlines. I got stuck in this aircraft, and the, of course the journey was terrible. 
Now, the reality is that if they were experiencing the, the service that I had, you know, they would understand, okay, right, that it was, it was below par. And ultimately, this is where this operational data and experience data comes into question. Now, the operational data from LATAM Airlines should have revealed the fact that Irfan Khan was sat in seat 12B, the seat wouldn't recline, so therefore there was a problem with the seat and they needed to get it fixed anyway. But they should also then connect to the dots. They should have realized that he actually is part of the One World Alliance. He's a British Airways customer. He has a high degree of loyalty. He has a high degree of number of loyalty points. It's incumbent upon them to make sure British Airways knows. And then literally on my return flight, they should have given me, a, even if it was a token gesture, because I was literally a broken man by this stage, they should have given me an upgrade, right? Should have been upgraded first or whatever it would have been. So that kind of represents the experience gap that we have. And technology in itself could solve part of the problem. But the reality is the way businesses are set up right now is they don't have the connectivity. They don't have the integration. They certainly don't have the capability to be able to broadly speak and talk about this experience back gap that's, that's building up. So now, from a technology platform perspective, and ultimately what Jurgen uh, presented in his keynote very well, and ultimately what SAP is now promoting to, to its customers, what we're trying to do, and this is really a journey, and it starts off by positioning the ultimate value of a technology platform, a business technology platform. And within the context of this business technology platform, it allows this operational data, or O data, to be linked with the experience data, the X data. And of course, it implies that there's going to be some intelligence in the middle. It's bi-directional. It happens to have the ability to be able to manage data, analyze data, predict, and plan. These are all the ingredients that are necessary within the platform. And I would maybe just make one other comment, and we can maybe uh, ask some questions here, is if we take a look at the way that our customers' environments, and I hear this every single day, irrespective of which region I travel to, the majority of our customers are now taking a cloud-first decision point, and that cloud-first decision point is for new organic applications. But the reality is that they have a vast amount of data that sits on-premise, probably 75, 80%. They have to assume that that data is going to be living there for quite some time, and they expect that their technology infrastructure and the landscapes that they operate in are going to be consistent. But what we're seeing in our industry right now is a lot of disruption. Tableau being acquired by Salesforce. We take a look at the hyperscalers growing at a phenomenal rate. It's almost like an arms war that's going on. Go back to the early 80s when you know, there was a nuke war going on between the, you know, the East and the West in terms of who's going to accumulate the largest number of nuclear weapons. This is essentially about compute and store now. Which hyperscaler is going to have the significant amount of you know, capacity for compute and store to attract customers so that they can grow, you know, both on an international basis, but also on a regional basis without disruption. So we see this huge disruption in the landscapes and infrastructure, and customers are, of course, asking the logical question, hey, SAP, would you tell us which of the hyperscalers you are allied to, what stack you would promote, and ultimately what the transition path is from the old to the new, or at least to the hybrid? And this is a reoccurring theme that we hear again and again from our customers. And let me maybe just fill out some of the answers to the, that, that statement that I, well, those statements that I just made. Firstly, on the infrastructure side, SAP has firmly committed its future based around the hyperscaler strategy. So as a SAP, although we've acquired you know, billions of euros worth of companies, there is no appetite on SAP's part to want to own data centers and accumulate data center capacity redundantly, just for the sake of wanting to be in the market. We take a hyperscaler-first partner-driven approach. So that's Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, the three US-based hyperscalers, Tencent, whether it's going to be China Mobile, and of course, Ali Cloud in the Far East. There's going to be an expansion of our, our usage and our interaction of the hyperscalers. That's point number one. Point number two, as it relates to transitioning and moving and, and supplementing what is going on on-prem, the vast majority of our customers have a move in mind but it's driven, driven by lots of different variables. Some of those moves are driven by technology requirements because they have an aging, almost a defunct environment that is you know, almost creaking to, to the point where it's no longer viable. They need to migrate because of technical reasons. Some of them are because they're being, the markets are being disrupted and the, the, the value is being disrupted. So they've got to leapfrog to see where the next level of growth is going to come from. Irrespective of what that journey point is in terms of the hyperscaler path, SAP has taken a very literal cloud-first development approach because we recognize that from a development perspective, and this is Jürgen and his organization, have to provide a great deal of value, but equally a great deal of simplicity in that migration journey that most, if not all, customers are on. So that's the, under, the second underpinning. So that's essentially a cloud-first development approach from SAP. 
It doesn't mean that we don't focus on on-prem. It certainly doesn't mean that we don't innovate on-prem, but as an approach, as a methodology, we kind of develop for the cloud first and we embrace the hyperscalers. The third element of this journey now is really about the value piece. And, and we've heard various talks and, and speakers today through the keynotes and other sessions that have been run. It's about how do you imply value from a move? Because clearly the value, it doesn't just come from looking at your balance sheet in terms of your bottom line or your, or your top line growth. It comes from the efficiency and the experiences that you then garner in the process. This is exactly where this experience gap comes in. And now I started off my little talk here by talking about my personal experiences. And every single one of our customers, whether they're a significant brand, whether they're of course an employee within those brands, whether they're a loyal kind of employee working in these organizations, they expect that experience gap to be narrowed, to be serving their needs. And this is another overarching requirement of SAP. And every customer journey that we're taking with our customers will have the undertone and the overtone of experience, which will then hopefully map across to the best possible outcome for them. Okay, so that was a quick summary. That's probably about five minutes, maybe a little bit more.